So, everyone kept telling me to build an IS-2 model for some reason. And by everyone I mean like two people. Which is actually more than enough to convince me to build a Soviet tank. So I did just that. Hey guys, Uncle Nightshift here. So this tank was requested several times and I coincidentally had one in my stash. And because I love Soviet armor, how could I say no to such a lovely little project? By little I mean this little. It's a 100 scale IS-2 from Zvezda and I think it's something like a war game model. It's very small and noticeably simplified, but that doesn't mean we can't have some fun with it and take a break from those long-term big projects. And if by any chance you're a wargamer, well, today is your lucky day. Also, I originally planned to make this into one single video and get like 5 million views, but in the end I spent about 6 days just painting this thing, so this model will be split into two videos. Let's now wind the clock back and see how this all started. I had this model sitting in my stash like this for... I don't know, but for very long, like years. And it doesn't look very good. Basically what I did back then, I just airbrushed it with Russian modulation set from ammo, gave it a coat of Tamiya clear varnish, blended a few oil dots and then applied the dark wash from AK Interactive. And then I just lost interest because it didn't look interesting at all. There wasn't anything special about building this thing, because the kit has about 10 parts. It's actually so simplified and I don't want to sound rude now, but it's so simplified it's basically a toy. Therefore I didn't feel like adding any details at all, except some quick improvements like adding the cast steel texture on both sides of the turret and also the front plate on the hull. And I also quickly drilled out the muzzle brake because this is such an obvious detail and it takes just a few seconds. The remaining details are simplified or out of scale, but some look actually pretty okay and with some painting they'll look even better. Yet I still don't see any reason to add missing details like grab handles or headlights or anything else to these small models, because it would still be just a toy-like model. With a few more details of course, but still a toy. There's just no reason to try and make it more authentic when you have running gear that looks like this. And because I don't like this paint job and because I want to give it the full painting experience, I'm gonna completely repaint this model and start from square one. So with that out of the way, let's get started. I first disassembled the model. Removing the turret is quite obvious, but I also made sure to paint the running gear separately. This will allow me to make the best out of those limited details on the tracks and wheels. This is my first time trying the one-shot primer from ammo. I really like the applicator on the bottle and although I was very skeptical because I just don't trust poly... poly... polyurethane... these primers anymore. This one was actually very easy to apply, it didn't clog up the airbrush and created a nice smooth surface. There were of course some minor imperfections from the previous paint job, so as usual I gently sanded and polished the surface with microfine sanding sponge. The ammo primer doesn't hold as well as Mr. Hobby when sanded, but I can still recommend it as an alternative. And now I have a perfectly clean and smooth model. I'll paint the 4BO color with the modulation set from ammo, just like on my first try many years ago, starting with the darkest paint and a little bit of their acrylic thinner. And yeah, I'm actually mixing the color like this. The darkest paint is obviously meant to be sprayed on the most shadowed parts where light cannot reach. This will create fake shadows and it's also a small trick because parts painted like this don't draw that much attention. So with a little bit of creativity you can use that to your own advantage. Next is the base color, which is like the mid-tone. Not too dark, not too bright. This is applied everywhere except those shadowed parts. 
Also, from now on I won't be filming every single bottle used in this video. Because there would be just too many of them and I want to make this video flow smoothly without any interruptions. I'll just reference each product on screen like I usually do. Like this. Without the ding of course. Now I'm using the highlight color. The name pretty much explains itself and I just want to note that this paint should cover most of the previously painted parts. This model is extremely small and has limited detail, so we have to make the most of what we have with paints, contrasts and weathering effects. And for that it's most important to have a very light paint job. Also, despite the fact that I'm using a modulation set, this method of application is not color modulation. It's more of a zenithal light technique where you constantly add lighter tones towards the top of your model. The last paint is called Shine. This one is already pushing the boundaries of the original color, so I'm using it very sparingly. This desaturated, almost grey color means we'll have to adjust the paint job with filters and oil paints. Nothing wrong about that though, it's just a personal preference thing and I just don't like the tone of this color. But before we get to that, it's important to push the contrast even further by brush painting all those small surface details with the lightest color. This is a technique used with color modulation and I'm sure so many of you will think that this is gonna look awful. And I hear ya, I really do. But this is a standard approach and one of the most important steps if you want an interesting paint job, especially on such a tiny model like this one. It's also one of the reasons why I didn't like my initial paint job on this model, because I completely skipped this step. Needless to say you have to crank up the contrast up to 11 because all the upcoming weathering techniques will tone it down. And if you want at least some of that to be visible in the end, you just have to make it look extreme like this. After all, the finished model I showed you at the beginning of this video is hopefully good enough proof of that. With all the details out of the way, I started sketching out the markings. I want this model to be as interesting and colorful as possible, so I'm going with those large hand-painted Berlin white stripes and numbers on the turret. Even though these markings were hastily painted by the tank crew in real life and it definitely shows in historical photos, it's no excuse to paint them poorly onto your model. If you paint them hastily with improperly thin paint, the result will be horrendous. So make sure to take your time, thin the paint down with a few drops of water and even add a drop of paint drying retarder if you can. You'll have to paint them in two or even three layers until you get a nice opaque result, but in the end it will be silky smooth without any visible paint buildup or nasty brush strokes, which would negatively affect the weathering. The fact that these markings were hand painted in real life makes this step very enjoyable because those lines don't have to be perfectly straight. So yeah, good times. And some of you might realize which tank I'm using as a reference for this. It's a pretty well known photo after all. But I'm not replicating it, it's just a loose reference. Maybe I can show you real quick. Let's see. I don't want to break any copyrights, so let's do some quick photoshopping and voila. Again, I'm not replicating that exact tank, mine is gonna be just some random generic Berlin IS-2 that just happens to look like that one from the photo. I didn't feel like building a historically accurate model when the kit looks like this. So yeah, my apologies. Okay, back to the main event. Hand painted markings usually mean some paint runs. And this is again clearly visible in literally every photo of every IS-2 ever. But in such a small scale like this you have to be very careful and paint them as fine as possible. Fine. As. Possible. With all the markings done I can now seal the paint job with a few good coats of semi-gloss varnish. The result won't be overly shiny, yet still smooth enough to make the upcoming weathering steps easier to apply and it will also contrast nicely with all the matte dust tones. And this is the only time I'm varnishing this model. 
keep that in mind, please. You don't need and in fact shouldn't protect any weathering with varnishes because it will make your model look dull. Again, this is the only time I'm varnishing this model. So the result so far looks like this and now we are ready for all the enamel and oil paint effects. Again, the contrasts are going through the roof at this point, but that's exactly what we need. So the first technique are filters. These are important if you're not exactly happy with the tone of your base coat. Like I mentioned, this 4BO is quite desaturated, so I'm using the filter to make it more vivid. This filter, however, doesn't work well with white markings, so I have to remove it in order to keep them white. This is actually visible on historical photos as well. Most of those tanks had their markings freshly painted without any visible fading or even chipping effects. Here you can see the subtle tonal difference between the turret with the filters applied and the hull still without them. But obviously we have to add them to the hull as well, and it's again clearly visible how the color changes in a very subtle way. Then I decided to add one more layer to make it look even more Russian. And because of that I also had to clean the markings one more time. After letting the filters dry for about half an hour, I started adding the oil dots. Again, no varnishing. I chose dark green, dark yellow and brown as these will work in conjunction with the 4BO base color. This technique is often called fading or discoloration because of the random tonal variations it creates. It's also essentially just another type of filter because it changes the color of the base coat. It was again important to remove the paint from the white markings. That yellowish tone just doesn't work with white. What does work with white is dust. But we'll get to that in the next video, so make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet because then you won't miss it. Now I left the oils to dry for about 6 hours because they dry much slower than the enamel filters and then I could start applying the washes. This might be the most important technique when you're painting small scale models like this one because it outlines every small detail and makes the model look bigger than it actually is. You might find it strange that I'm using a wash designed for German dark yellow, but it works great for this paint job because the base color is very light. I'll create more dramatic contrasts with the darker wash in the second video. With these few simple techniques the model already looks presentable and you might just call it done and nobody would question your decision. Also note how all the heavy contrasts are already getting toned down to a more natural finish. But let's take it a little bit further. This is a technique I used to call forced contrast, but some of my subscribers gave it a much better name. Ambient occlusion. That's a technique used in digital modeling and texturing, but apparently what I'm doing right now is basically the same thing. And it honestly sounds way more professional than forced contrast. So let's keep calling it ambient occlusion. It will make us look more professional. The point of this technique is to apply diluted oil paint around specific parts and details and then blend it with a completely dry brush. The result looks weathered because those stains can simulate shadows but also spots where large amounts of dirt had accumulated. Let's now create some chipping. I wanted to work as fast and efficient as possible, so I started with some speckling. The first layer is just heavily diluted oil paint mixture with consistency of a filter that resembles the highlight color from the ammo modulation set. This is just to give the surface some subtle random texture. Then using the same paint mixture but thicker, with consistency of a wash, I applied many small dots. These resemble small paint chips and imperfections in the camouflage paint created by shrapnel and just overall wear and tear. This process can sometimes get out of hand because of its random nature and that's why we're using oil paints. They're easy to blend or even remove if something doesn't go as planned. Now for some more refined chipping. This time I'm using the lightest color from the modulation set, aka Shine, and my finest Vallejo 000 brush. There's a point where you can't go any smaller with brush painted chipping, so I use this technique to paint just the largest chips, round edges, and the most exposed parts, while the speckling technique I used before took care of the smaller chips. 
This light color represents superficial paint damage where the top weathered layer has been worn off, revealing the fresh paint underneath. And now I filled them with a dark gray steel color. This obviously represents those deep chips that went all the way through the paint down to the metal. Just make sure to keep some of the light chips visible. They'll act as an outline for the darker ones, making them more visible and detailed. And to make the chipping look more natural and tie all the different chipping techniques together, I added small amounts of enamel rust tones on top of the biggest chips. It's important to be very careful with this step because it's so easy to overdo it in such a small scale like this. I know there's been a lot of discussion about rust on operational tanks or that cast steel doesn't rust. But I think this effect creates that heavily used military look and adds so much to the authenticity of any armor model. Something that's supposedly not realistic adds authenticity. Well that's an interesting contradiction. But whatever, it makes the model look bigger and heavier, period. One last detail was to paint the tools. I'm gonna demonstrate this on the shovel. So the first step is to paint the wooden handle with acrylic paints. Then you can add some dark brown oil paint around the clamp and the metal blade and then just blend it with a completely dry brush. With the handle done, we can now paint the blade with dark grey acrylic paint. This is actually the same paint I used for the chipping. And then add a heavy enamel rust wash. The remaining effects on the shovel will be created with dust tones in the next video. And that's it, my friends. At least for tonight. The model looks actually pretty interesting if I do say so myself. I honestly didn't think you could apply so many effects to such a small model. But there's still so much to be added, aka dust, mud, grease and smoke effects. But that's a topic for the second video. And we'll also try to make the most out of this simplistic running gear, so make sure to drop by the next week. Thank you all for watching, I'll see you mates in the next one and here are some bloopers. It didn't clog up in the... <laughs> oh, the... <sighs> this will create fake shadow... Debil in the email. Next x... Next x... <laughs> the fact that the... Uh, the fact that... Bl now I left the... Now I... <sighs> But I think this effect gives that heavily used military look, military look, military look, mil military, blah, blah, blah.